Tim, firstly, it is lovely to see you. And thank you very much indeed for coming in to say hello to us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, we were just saying there off air, the buzz around this building is incredible at the moment. Um, you must be well aware of that. How do you find coping with that? I mean, you are Tim Peake. So is that, how, how does that work? Well, I, I am. I have been overwhelmed by the response to the mission, but actually, in a, in a brilliant way. Everything's been very positive, and I just love the fact that people are so interested about space, about exploration, and about science. Um, me and my astronaut colleagues, we love it. Of course, we're very passionate about it. We like talking about it, so it's great that everyone else does too. It's a real, um, it's a real leveler in a way, isn't it? I mean, just every everybody I know is fascinated by speaking to somebody like you who's been to space. It just really. That there's something in us, isn't there? It just it kind of sparks the imagination. It does. I, I, we know we're all humans. I think we have this innate desire to explore, to push the boundaries. And that's exactly what we're doing. You know, we've been using the International Space Station as this test bed for 20 years now. And we're about to start taking those next, next steps. We're going to be starting to see new rockets rolling off the, the launch pads that are going to take us back to the moon and onto Mars. And that's really exciting. Now, in terms of how you got the gig, um, you are the ultimate competition winner essentially, aren't you? Just, just talk us through briefly how that process worked. Uh, so, yeah, I was in my 30s. I was a test pilot uh, and I saw an online advert from the European Space Agency saying, you know, astronauts wanted for the new core. And along with about, uh, I think, about 12,000 others, I applied. Eight and a half thousand of us went forward for the first selection test. And then over a grueling one year selection process, they managed to whittle that down from eight and a half thousand to just six. Incredible. And that moment when you're told, yes, you're going into space. I mean, try and describe that if you can. Uh, yes, it was a spring evening and I was just enjoying, uh, uh, you know, enjoying a meal outside in the garden and I had this phone call. And, I, and by this time, I thought I, I hadn't got it because there was a, I knew there was going to be a press conference on the Wednesday announcing the new astronauts. And this was Monday night. So I thought, well, all the new astronauts, they've been told who they are and it's not me. And I had this uh, phone call with a Paris number. And I thought actually it was going to be the phone call to say, I'm sorry, you didn't make it. And of course, it, it wasn't. It was to say, would you like to come and join the call? And it was absolutely mind blowing. I was reading on launch, you get to choose three tracks. Yes. that you can go up uh, to space with, you know, listening to. One of those you chose was U2, Beautiful Day. Yeah. I'm a massive U2 fan, and I applaud you for choosing that track. Uh, why that one, and how difficult is it? I mean, because that's the ultimate playlist. You're, you know, I'm sure you will go back to space, and hopefully you will one day. But I mean, as far as you know, at that time, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Mm. Those three tracks are vitally, imp really important. Why, why choose U2? Uh, I wanted something. I thought, well, you know, you're you're sitting on top of 300 tons of explosive fuel. You've got time to kill. You want something that is lively, punchy, entertaining. You you want to go off in 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 the right frame of mind. And, and these three tracks to me were they just mean an awful lot. I actually saw uh, you two playing that in in Wembley, live in Wembley. So it took me back to a brilliant night. Uh, and uh, sorry, Twickenham, not not Wembley. Yes, Twickenham, yeah. Uh, and took me back to a brilliant night there watching them. And, and the, you know, it's just that's the kind of music that I wanted to. Uh, to hear just before launch fantastic and you also got a um a playlist of like over 100 songs as well foo fighters are on there am i right muse is on there as well is, yeah. is that the kind of stuff that you're, you're into music wise i am yeah i have a really eclectic mix of of taste in music it, yeah. it swings all over the place um uh, and it's just really what grabs me at the moment and i i wanted again i i wanted music that i wanted to work out to up there we, we have to exercise for two and a half hours a day so i wanted some decent music to listen to uh and so it's a really you know varied uh, uh mix of music on my playlist there okay now we were talking about the fact that we've got you coming on the show this this week. Um, Chris Moyles, uh, he's never been to space either, Tim. Um, and he had uh, it's quite an in-depth question for you. How do you poo in space, Tim? Okay. Uh, going to the loo in space, pooing in space, it's all about airflow. Um, air is right. your friend up there. It keeps things moving in the right direction. Without it, everything's just going to float around and cause a horrible mess. So... Hmm. We have to switch on a fan uh, and then we open this uh, this container, solid waste container, and there's a small bag in there that's got thousands of tiny holes that allow airflow to go through the bag that keeps everything, it sucks everything like a small hoover, really. It sucks it into this bag. Wow. So we can then crouch over this solid waste container, put into the bag, and if all goes well and your aim is right, then you end up with everything staying neat and tidy. Wow. And a successful docking. So to speak. Um, what? How does smell work in space? Does smell work in the same way it works on Earth? 
It does, although uh, our sense of smell is a bit reduced. We get very bl- blocked up stuffy noses really quite a lot because all the blood and our body fluid rises up to our chest with no gravity to hold it in, in our legs. And so uh, we get an increased intracranial pressure and that causes our nose to get a bit blocked up. So we don't really smell, I don't think, as well as we do on Earth. Uh, but again, airflow is good there for taking bad smells away. All the bad smells just get sucked out into the fans and then our air gets recycled, recleaned and then pumped back into the space station. One thing that I didn't realise, and I should have realised this, I mean, my job's a, a, a jet, well, I'd say a journalist, very loosely based. I'm, you know, I read the news and sort of muck about a little bit. Uh, I didn't know the space station was so close. I didn't know it was, what is it, 250 miles from Earth? That's right, yeah, yeah, 400 kilometres up. It is It is close, um, and it's, it's in low Earth orbit. It's a very low Earth orbit, which means it goes around really fast. The higher up you go, actually, the slower the orbit, the sp- orbital speed is. So we're going around the Earth at 25 times the speed of sound because we're so low to the Earth, just 400 kilometres. And the speed that you go up is, am I right in saying it's around 7,000? or 17,000 miles an hour? That's right, yeah. 17,600 is the magical speed that we have to attain, and that will then keep us in orbit and prevent us from dropping back down into Earth's atmosphere. Now, I was very lucky recently to borrow a Jaguar F-Type, um, <laughs> and you know we were flooring it on the M1. Uh, how does 17,000 miles feel to you, and are you sure it's not a little bit dangerous? Uh, it probably is a little bit dangerous, it, it, but it is worth it. <laughs> <laughs> but it must. I mean, it seriously, feels incredible. How do you not just disintegrate going at that speed? It's it's phenomenal. Well, we take we take eight minutes and forty eight seconds to get there, but we're accelerating off the launch pad. We're accelerating at the same rate as a Formula One car, but for that entire duration. Right. Uh, in the, in the initial phases of the launch, you don't feel the speed so much. You feel the vibration, the noise, and you're going straight up. You're going up into space, out of Earth's atmosphere. Yeah. For me, where where the speed really kicks in is the third stage by this time you've jettisoned two stages of your rocket so your rocket's actually very small but it's still got a very punchy engine on it and the the rocket is pretty much horizontal now you're up into space and it's all about getting to Mach 25 and the eye was just pinned back four g's for you know several minutes in your seat and that's when you get a, a huge sensation of speed Mach, overwhelming Mach 25 so i'm right in saying concord used to get to Mach 2 is that right yes about that yeah um, so, okay that's that's quick then that's that's so, very very quick yeah yeah it's very quick <laughs> it's phenomenal absolutely phenomenal you spoke russian you you learned fluent russian and i guess that was as big a challenge as actually getting to the international space station it was a huge challenge yeah, for me. yeah, yeah it's russian, not, not an easy language to learn i imagine no, languages don't come naturally to me it's right. not, an e- not an easy language to learn but um yeah everything inside the soyuz rocket everything is spoken in russian all the documents in russian there's no english translation all our communication to the moscow is in russian so we have to learn russian to be able to communicate and also you know we're up there with our, our cosmonaut colleagues so uh, it's nice just to be able to socialize but we tend to have this mix we call it runglish whereas <laughs> you know we we will speak a mixture of Russian and English just to make ourselves all understood. <laughs> How is your Russian now? Is it still with you? It's very rusty now. It? No, okay. I haven't spoken it for a while. Fine. So, rusty yeah. Russian. Okay, rusty that's fine. Russian. Are you going to go back? I hope to go back, yes. Yeah, the space station is going to be there until about 2024 at least, probably a few years longer than that. And me and my classmates out of that, that uh, 8,500, we got down to six. So me and my other classmates, we've all got the chance to go back for a second mission. And obviously the work that you do up there is sort of ever-evolving. Um, what what would you like to do up there that you didn't do on the, on the last mission, for instance? Well, we don't we don't get to kind of choose what we're going to do. We we do the science program that's running at the time, but that's what that is. What is interesting, as you said, there it, it's evolving and um, it's fascinating. I mean, just as I was leaving the space station, we were starting to do DNA sequencing on on board the space station, and that hadn't been done before. During our mission, we started doing some research into flame combustion that hadn't been done previously. So every single mission, there there are new things being thought up as to experiments where we're we're researching, we're finding out how different materials behave in, in weightlessness um so it's fascinating to think what what experiments i might be getting involved in in a a few years time on a second mission it's been absolutely fascinating meeting you thank you so much indeed for coming in thank you um i really do hope you go back into space and i know as a father of three you have really inspired my children uh in terms of just thinking what is possible generally i'm sure you've heard this is not an original thought i'm sure you've heard this many times but um you know, they, they, when, you, when you were up in space, they were monitoring it constantly in their school, as I'm sure all children around the country were. Do you feel a sense of, I mean, it must make you very proud that also, but a kind of 
a sense of responsibility, I guess, in some way as well. Yeah, there is a, resp- a sense of responsibility. Yeah, definitely. But I, uh, I'm just, you know, like I said, I'm really happy that we have this feeling in the UK now that you know space is accessible. It is something you can do. I went to a, a normal comprehensive school, uh, left school through, you know, age 18 with three A levels, joined the army, and and you know here I am, having flown a six month mission in space. Uh, and and that's the message that I, I want, you know, the students and kids in the UK to take away. Everything is available for you. These things are achievable. Brilliant. Tim, lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Dom. Thank you. Radio X.